Hey, Off-White Coat listeners, it is my privilege to get to tell you about this sweet deal from our friends over at Pygmonic. If you haven't heard about Pygmonic, it is a fantastic picture-based mnemonic platform that can certainly help out any student. Most of the videos are around two minutes long and provide a quick and effective way to memorize material for any upcoming medical exam. It is extremely efficient. They have this search bar function where you can search playlists on general topics like renal to step one to step two, or even first aid and other books. If you want to review the Pygmonic for later, you can even make a playlist of your own. Pygmonic even has this repetition algorithm that is spaced out according to your learning needs. This helps with increasing long-term retention and allows you to review the right information at the right time. One of my favorite functions is the quizzes that are associated with each Pygmonic. I'll take the quiz first and then learn about the associated pictures and what facts I need to sharpen up on. Honestly, Pygmonic is a fantastic tool, and if you use our code OFFWHITECOAT, you'll get 20% off. That's off white coat with no spaces. So what are you waiting for? Make studying the easiest part of your day. Sign up with Pygmonic and use off white coat to save yourself some money. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Off White Coat Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Abney. I started this podcast to kind of showcase the new upcoming talent in the medical field and really just talk to interesting people that I've met. And this person is certainly a very interesting individual. Uh, I'm joined today by Melissa Skinner. My, uh, I guess you will eventually be my sister-in-law one day. But besides just being connected by that, she's an occupational training or she's in occupational therapy school right now. And she's going through the works just like everybody else. Yeah. Introduce yourself, Melissa. Hey, I'm Melissa. Most people call me Mel. Um, unfortunately, Jordan will probably be my brother-in-law, but... At least her first ex-brother-in-law. Yes, yes. Yeah. First ex-brother-in-law. Um, but yes. Yeah. And you're about to be a... I've had a couple doctors on this podcast or future, but you're going to be the first occupational therapist and you will also be a doctor coming up, right? Yes. So, uh, at the end of everything, Jordan and I will have the same title, but I will have my doctorate in occupational therapy. And after that, I will not answer to anything, but Dr. Skinner. I'll still call you Mel. (laughs) That works. That works. Uh, how has occupational therapy school been? Yeah, so I went to occupational therapy school at the University of St. Augustine for health sciences, and uh, I started at the peak of COVID, so everything was online for the first three terms. We have four terms of didactic-like classroom work, and then two terms of clinicals, and then two terms of the doctorate capstone. So my first three terms were completely online, and uh, I have lots of things I can say about that. But overall, I took a year off after undergrad because I honestly, I didn't get into occupational therapy school anywhere. And um, I ended up liking the University of St. Augustine on Facebook. And one day they called me and said, hey, we have extra spots in our summer program if you want to apply. So I was like, screw it. I have nothing to lose. I'll apply. And Mm -hmm. then two days later, I was in and this was May of 2020. And they told us that we would be on campus the week of July 4th. So I packed my stuff, moved to St. Augustine, and then never stepped foot on campus until third term. (laughs) You had a quick turnaround the second you got in. Yeah, the second I was in, I was gone. Um, Something similar, though, happened to me with medical school at St. George's, I was so against, it wasn't that I was against going international. My mom went to AUC, which is American University of Caribbean. You know, I'd lived in St. Martin for a while. It was just the fact that I really wanted to like hold out. And I I was just doing the whole application process. And then it, it happened to be an email. And I just was like, ah, uh, maybe not. And then I just like, screw it, I'll apply. And from there, it was just a, like it literally, once the snowball started rolling, I started getting out acceptances and stuff. And I was like, oh, but because SGU was one of the more nicest one that I had seen, I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. um, So I actually, I had done like all the undergrad stuff that I needed to do to get into OT school. And 
I uh, applied at my alma mater, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and they required a 300 on the GRE. So I took all that time to study for the GRE and came out with a 298. Mm. So I was like, well, there goes that one. And Uh. so then I ended up at St. Augustine and I said, well, you know, if I have to be in school anymore, I might as well do it at the beach. So I ended up in St. Aug and here we are. You only need one. You really only need one. Uh, You're a true testament to that is, where you really were dead set on going. You really wanted to go to your alma mater. You had a whole system and a plan set up, and you were definitely qualified. It just happened to be litigation errors, I think. Yeah, but everything happens for a reason. I wouldn't trade my time in St. Augustine for the world. Exactly. Uh, So I I ended up right where I needed to be. Was there any restrictions? Because you said you started at the very beginning of COVID. Oh, yeah, yeah. So... Everything was online, even though we were in Florida and Florida's, you know, wide open. We had our classes online, our cadaver labs were online, and I had never seen a dead body before anyway, but to see that thing up close and personal on my laptop screen, that was, uh, that was an experience. And then, um, how did y'all do the cadaver labs online? So the, like, did they just go the picking teacher, around? No, the teacher legit went around with her iPhone and was like, this is this and this is that. And I'm like, I don't even know what I'm looking at. It's all gray and nasty. Yeah. Uh, That's so, how it feels when yeah, you're in the cadaver lab. Yeah. So. So, so, I mean, I guess it was the same as being in person except without the no, smell I mean, of formaldehyde. But Yeah, so you probably lucked out on that end. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. still confused. You yeah, just stink yeah. So, it. um so that was that was different and then really a lot of uh we all learned to be adaptable during that time because learning a hands-on profession in an online environment is is not ideal and you have to practice certain things and uh get ready to go to clinicals and really all you have to practice on is your roommates or your friends and then you have to make you know make shift or make stuff out of stuff you have at home. Like me and my roommate, one day we got voluntold during a class to demonstrate how you use crutches. When you say voluntold. Voluntold. Like where are yeah, you? So, okay, okay. That's so, what I figured. So the teacher was like, is there anybody out there who's living together right now? And, and you some look people at each were. other, but the background of the room <laughs> yeah. is the same. Yeah. We, <laughs> uh, so, Some people were, some people weren't, and somebody put in the stupid chat box, Mel and Julia are at their apartment. So, Uh, of of course, the teacher's like, all right, Mel and Julia, show us how you use crutches. And I'm like, who in their right mind, you know, who doesn't know how to use crutches? But anyway, we, we didn't have crutches at home, so we went in our, in our closet and found two pool noodles, and we, we pulled those out and did the best we could, and then we just got roasted. (laughs) <laughs> by the professors about how the therapist didn't maintain patient contact the whole time and the patient flopped on the bed and the crutches weren't the right height and all this. And I'm like, there's only so much I can do with a, a pool noodle. Yeah, I love how you're using a, poo- a pool noodle and they're like, well, it's not really the correct height. For a crush, yeah. right? <laughs> like, do you not know? I don't, this? I, do you realize I'm in my bedroom right now? Yeah. So, so I'm in pajamas with a pool, pool noodle right now. Yeah, yeah, eat. yeah. So I'm I'm professional on top, pajamas on the bottom. So <laughs> besides like the pool noodles and everything, how was that? Would That's you a, rather have been there or would uh, absolutely, you absolutely. I I would have rather been at on campus at school, but you know I have to give credit to my school where it's due and say. I think they did the best they could with the situation we were in. And I can honestly say I, I had a great time on my first clinical experience. I didn't I didn't feel like I had been fed to the sharks. So obviously they were doing something right. And I learned a little bit, even mm. if it was online. Yeah, with my school, I spent most of my medical, the very first two years in Grenada and COVID, this was before COVID. And then at the very last term of my medical school is when COVID came into the picture. And when I did that, our school tried to adapt and they sent us all home and they tried to do the online thing. But you could tell that the small groups, like the things where we would go meet up and we would discuss certain diseases and we would have group activities to teach us. 
they didn't change them at all because for the online thing. They tried to just do the same thing, and it didn't it transfer, didn't transfer. over. Yeah. Yes. Well, the good thing about my school is that they they take pride in the fact that they're a hybrid school anyways. They have a special program for people who like work during the week and can come to school on the weekend. So our lectures and stuff would have been online regardless. Like we would have had mm-hmm. to watch the lecture videos and stuff online regardless if we would have been in person, or at least that's what I was told. I I can only go off of my own personal experience, well, but... I mean, that's great, though. I'm glad that it, it worked yeah, out so yeah, well. Yeah, it, it worked out. It worked out good. So. I mean, you pumped out. You're pretty much going to be done at the same time that I am. Yeah, and like I said, we'll have the same title. Yeah, so. You might be <laughs> a doctor before I am. How long is occupational therapy school? So different programs have different timelines and whatnot, but we, like I said before, we go four terms for didactic, and each term is 15 weeks. And then we have two 12-week clinical rotations. And then if you're in the master's program, you're done. And you are considered an occupational therapist. And then if you're in the doctorate program, you have an extra two terms to do your capstone project. And then you're done and you have your doctorate in occupational therapy. And can you work in the hospital after the master, like during those two years that you're working on your doctorate? Oh, um, or do you, are you just strictly? You're just continue you're schooling? strictly doing your doctorate capstone because you're not allowed to take the uh, national board exam okay. for to be like a certified occupational therapist mm-hmm. until you're all the way done. Okay, yeah. So you have to do board certified. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's that. like a national board mm-hmm. exam. And so you're just gonna you've already made it into the little doctorate capstone you know i'm working on i'm not to that part yet i still have one clinical left but i'm hashing out the kinks in my project idea and then after i think in may i'll actually start my project nice so when you say project what do you mean like you don't have to tell me your exact project but you have to do essentially a, like a doctorate project. Does it have to be specifically hospital related? Uh, no, no. Or? So you take whatever aspect of ac- occupational therapy that you're passionate about. You take it, you know, you can create a program, you can do research, you can basically do anything you want to make yourself stand out as a specialist in what er- whatever area you choose to do your doctor uh your capstone project in and I'll be honest I initially I was um in the master's program at school and I heard that you could transfer over into the doctorate program without having to go through like the ap- application process and stuff you just transfer over and so I was like you know I'm honestly not coming back to school after this. I'm never putting myself through this again. So I'm going to transfer over now and knock it all out at one time. So I don't, I don't know all the details about the process. I just take it one day at a time, one term at a time, and just do what I'm told to get to the next step. Man, that is the best way to describe it. That's exactly how you have to do it. Is there anything that like drove you to specifically go to occupational therapy school? Yeah. So, um, A lot, actually, let me take a step back. A lot of people don't know that or what occupational therapy is. So I will give my general definition and then talk about how I got here. So please do. Occupational therapy, the way I see it, it is every part of every career path ever, whatever part that they don't want to do, an occupational therapist does. Like some days, Some days I'm a chef. Some days I'm an athletic trainer. Some days I'm a CNA. Some days I'm an IT. Some days I'm a hairdresser. You just really never know. It's all patient specific on what they need and want to do to be successful on their own, whatever they define as success. Mm. So, so when I see you in the kitchen, you know, down there in the kitchen yeah. at the hospital. Yeah, mil- all that- yeah meal prep is an occupation. So, <laughs> so. You know, I just do, I just, we just do what the patient wants. Um, and that's what kind of led me to it because I, I get bored very easily. And, you know, this is something that will absolutely not be different every day. Also, what led me to it is I had always been on the patient side of it because I have 
cerebral palsy and as my family calls it cerebral but I'm just putting it out there it is absolutely <laughs> cerebral and I did not know that until I started OT school and learned parts of the brain but yeah they were brainwashing you the whole yes, time yes yes I was brainwashed You're... until I was <laughs> 20 24 so you were diagnosing yourself wrong the whole time. <laughs> They're like, what? I don't think I've heard of that one. Yeah. So I have cerebral palsy and I had been on um, the, the patient side of OT. And I really just saw being becoming an occupational therapist as a way to um, give back to all those people that put so much into me to get me where I am today. Most people, you know, most people don't even know I have CP unless I tell them. Uh, so I consider... OT, a rewarding profession because it helped me out a lot. That is amazing. And it's amazing that you are giving back in the same thing, in the same career path that helps you out. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to have Melissa on is because she really is a true, I guess, testament of hard work. And, you know, when the dice are cast, she's kind of like, you would not, if I, if you saw her, you would not know that she had CP and that she had a essentially struggle getting the whole walking. I like, just got you, a little get, gun walk. Yeah. Just you got <laughs> a little, yeah. Like you, if anything, you're one of the like Mary Beth's like hot sisters. Like everybody <laughs> sees pictures of y'all and they're like, Oh my God, like who is this girl? Who's the shorter girl? And uh, so it's like, this it really is a, a testament to how much you've put in. When I see people with uh, cerebral, now I got to think about it. So I don't, you know, the, just say CP. Cere- just say- yeah. When, when I see people with cerebral palsy in the hospital, it was unique because I knew you. And then when I saw patients, I mean, it can be pretty rough and you're, you're definitely sitting at the higher percentage of functioning for that. Oh yeah, no doubt. I, um, I haven't got the chance to actually see a, a real life patient with it before yet because I'm about to do my pediatrics rotation. Mm. So I'll, I'm sure I'll see more of it there, but I definitely am on the, like you said, the higher end of the. Yeah. You're very unique in a lot of ways. I think. For one, it's actually very helpful for me because when you know, when you've seen somebody with something, you can kind of remember that and it helps you remember like the risk. Fact- like, so when I was in medical school and every question I would get, you know, baby born prematurely, you know, it's stuff like that would trigger me to think of you. Uh, oh, because okay. that's exactly okay. what happened for Melissa is she, their family was on vacation. They didn't even expect her to be born. It was early, early. Yeah. Like, I'm sure everybody was, was it, pretty drunk. <laughs> when... Hopefully not your mom. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully not my mom. <laughs> Maybe that was the problem. <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, everybody was on vacation and uh, mom, mom was like, you know, something, something's up. And so they called the doctor and the doctor was like, no, we think it's just Braxton Hicks contractions. Mm-hmm. Just take a bath or whatever. Well, the hot water ran out. And then, you know, I don't know the story. They tell it every year on my birthday, but I, I kind of just tune out. Oh, uh, anyway, I ended story. up. Yeah, like the story of it. Christmas that's comes it. every year. I ended up being born at 28 weeks and suffered a uh, massive brain bleed and they didn't know if I was going to make it or not. So, but here I am. No, still living, kicking living too. Living the dream, living the dream. I guess since we brought up the hefty topic anyway about, like I said, nobody would even know. I mean, if anything, you're vastly intelligent and it's not like you have mobility issues. When I see a lot of people that have CP that I've seen in the hospital or something, they they sometimes come get checked out or or things like that. And a lot of them are can barely even get around, like whether they're bed bound or they have wheelchairs or something like that. Uh, the mobility aspect is a big deal. Your mom is very, I guess, like dedicated. Or she like when you, in your childhood you described that she worked with. You oh constantly. yeah, yeah. So m- mom always describes it as like if the therapist said take this home and do it ten times, she did it thirty, and I I swear I believe it because that lady is uh, headstrong and proactive about making sure she does her part to help out. So I owe my mom a lot and. <laughs> I got to give a shout out to my dad too, but I just don't know how to. <laughs> <laughs> no, a good support system yeah, good is, support. is key. Good support system for sure. Yeah. Um, Do you think that that work 
early on in your childhood helped you as you got later on and everything? Oh, yeah, there's no doubt. My parents, I absolutely would not be where I am without them. They they pushed me to be just like Mary Beth. And then when Livia came along, just to be just like her and do everything that they did. And I, that's what I wanted to do as well. Because I mean, I look up to my sister and I wanted to play sports like she was playing sports. So I did it. Mm. I was about to say that's the the crazy thing is I know your ba- your family is a whole basketball family and you would think that that would be out of the cards for you. Oh well, let's but not, it's not. Let's not bring up my basketball career. She's got the cutest only, little basketball photo. <laughs> I only made two points, two points in my Yo, whole career, but no. my dad says they were the best shot free throws ever shot. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> but no, that even in that the just. Being there, pushing yourself, teaching yourself that you can do things, it really means a lot in your psyche later on. It, oh, it does. And, you know, I've never had the outlook of, oh, I have CP, I might not be able to do that. I, If I want to do something, then I do it. If I can't do it, then I ask for help. Like, I, I don't see CP as a, as a hindrance because it's, it's all I've known. So this is normalcy for me. So I just take it and run with it. It's interesting, yeah. And another thing that I find that's interesting is the one thing that I guess would limit your mobility, which is uh, you kind of have like a limp, but the or it's because your leg length yes, discrepancy. Yes, I you have, have a little bit of leg length yes. discrepancy, and that's not because of the CP. That's because of the surgery you needed as a child, right? So I did have. To, you know, I don't, I don't know what it's from. I, I, I know I mean, my, it could be a multiple it could factors. Be, yeah, just, yeah. I'm going off of the Christmas story. Yes. <laughs> and who knows how reliable the Christmas story is. So <laughs> I had two tendon lengthening surgeries in my life. One was when I was really young and then one I was in middle school and that just helped to um, increase the mobility of the muscles in my ankle because I cannot like flex or well we call it plantar flex and dor- dorsi flex but mm-hmm. I'm trying I'm trying to water stuff down for the people that up and down may not up and down <laughs> there we yeah. go there we go if you move your foot up <laughs> and then down like a gas yeah. pedal you're doing both right right so I got those tendons lengthened so that I would be able to do those uh motions without having to wear a leg brace which I did up until high school but then after that I was like no I'm, I'm done just, with this did I, you just force gump run out of it yeah <laughs> no no I, I just put it to the side in the closet and <laughs> and went on so that's amazing. No, you really are. It is truly a testament because you really do everything. Like even still, you're still running on or walking on treadmills and doing things like that to keep yourself in shape. When you see other people in hospital with the same condition, and then you see like what could be the high end and what could be the, the low end, you're like, oh, like, ugh. You're lucky, I guess. Like sometimes you get a lucky throw of the dice, but you've also continued to work and you're, you still push yourself on a daily with the occupational therapy and stuff. Right, right. Um, which I actually, I didn't know how, um, physically demanding occupational therapy would be until I, until I started my clinicals and I was like, okay, maybe I should work out a little more. (laughs) That's what I was going (laughs) to ask. Is there anything that is physically demanding that you have that, has been a struggle for you? Um, so I would say like patient transfers is my biggest issue just because of the of the body mechanics of it. Not not because I'm not strong enough to do it or whatever, but you have to, you know, you have to move your body with the patient's body at the same time. And sometimes the thing about CP is that you know what you want to do, but your body doesn't always do it. And so when you transfer a patient, you got to, you know, shift your weight from one side to the other or this or that. And, you know, I, I know exactly where I want this person to end up, but the steps to get them there is can be a little bit challenging for me. But one of my professors at school took some extra time to help work with me on that. And That's I, awesome. yeah, so I, I did it. When I you did say my, patient transfers. Do you mean transferring from bed to bed or so, walking around? And- um, 
physical therapy does more of the walking, but when I say tr- patient transfers, I mean like from bed to wheelchair or from wheelchair wheelchair to shower or anywhere they need to go uh, to do anything they need to do. So mm. I had to transfer this guy off of a toilet once. And it was a very interesting, it was very early in my medical career. And I was like with a cardiologist and the guy came for his cardiology appointment. And then he had to go to the bathroom and we couldn't find the patient. And he had sat down on the toilet, but he couldn't get up. And the doctor couldn't have lifted him. It was a Mm -hmm. small, and I'm, I'm a bigger guy. He was certainly a bigger guy. And so it was very interesting. Me, tra- I had to <laughs> essentially bear hug this guy on the toilet, and he like hugged me, and we just had to like stand up together. Yeah, it's it's a- really awkward. The shower transfers are what get me because you you know you're you're right up on this naked person, and they're like, I don't know you. I'm like, I don't know you. And yeah. but you know you kind of lose all. You just do what you got to do in the moment to help the person. It's work. It, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't matter that they're naked. They still need to get in the shower. That, yeah, that's the interesting thing is when you see. First off, the best thing to best way to describe it is the way an ER doctor told me he was an older ER doctor, and he said every person you see naked in this hospital is somebody that you will not want to see naked. So don't worry. <laughs> I and believe it. I believe it. I. It still holds true. It still holds true, and it really is. It's just us being very used to anatomy and everything. Anyway, you know, it's not like. While it might be sexualized for some people, not saying in the medical field, I'm saying just like people in general, like they, when you see, you know, genitalia, you might yeah, be whatever, yeah. but it, it's kind of just, it is what it is. It, you're in the a body's a body. People. Let's do what we have to do and go yeah. on about our lives. But yeah, I mean, you're right. Some, some of my patients, uh, male patients that I had, I had a home health rotation so i saw so much stuff that i never thought i would see in my life we're gonna have to get to that yeah but, continue we, your story. <laughs> but this one patient in particular he had we were helping him with toilet transfers because he had very bad dementia and he also was losing his ability to get around and he couldn't get to the toilet in a safe manner so we were working on that and i said Hey, do you need to go while we're in here? You know, you might as well go because it took a lot of work to get here. And he said, yeah, I'll sit here for a while. And then I uh, went to go help him get up and pull his pants up. And me and my clinical instructor noticed that he had this sore on his private part. And we're like, man, you got to put something on that. And he's like, no, no, don't touch me. Don't touch me. And he like thought we, and then he sat back down and he forgot what we were doing. So he, he took it sexually and thought we were trying to like touch him. And I'm like, no, bro, trust me. I, I don't want to touch it either. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So we uh, ended up, we had to put cream on it or whatever, but it's just crazy how desensitized you become Mm -hmm. when you do this all day, every day. And I can empathize with like patients. That's a private area of your body. You kind of want that covered. And then, you know, people just come in and throw your gown open and they're just like looking at, like, I can understand why, especially in like surgeries and stuff that only the area that is being operated on is shown, you know, everything. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it definitely makes sense because it is like we're saying, it is a private part. But in the end, it actually is very beneficial to like disclose everything because there was one time I was with an attending and it was a female attending. And I mean, it was a male resident too. So I don't know why it must have been because I spent a lot of time with this guy, but it was, you know, in one of my first rotations. So during that, you, you spent a lot of time talking to the patients and I did it. Like I, I went in after all the attending and the resident had been in. I'm just talking to this guy and he had like all these ulcers and everything. So I'm like checking all of them out. And then he was like, by the way, I have a couple other things like, and he's like pointing at his waist and he wasn't going to tell the doctor and he wasn't going to tell the residents, but he decided to tell me. And it really was like the perfect example of like the Swiss cheese method where you keep, everybody goes in and asks the same yeah. questions. Because you don't really get the exact same experience. and stuff stuff falls through the cracks um, and, and had, until like, you're two, until yeah. you're in a situation like that and it's like well was nobody going to do anything about this mm-hmm. and that's the thing uh, I I try to always take the time to try to get to know somebody before especially 
with home health, I'm a guest in their house. If they don't want me there, then they have the right to say no. Mm -hmm. And so I always try to like go in and be their friend before I tell them what to do in their own, you know, what they need to be doing in their own house. So that helped me, figure, uh, you know, get rid of those kinks that you're, or the Swiss cheese model that you're talking about. It, yeah, that's it the best find way to a, do it, yeah. Help find a little bit more of those, that stuff that maybe necessarily they weren't talking about to anybody else. And then I was able to report it to the doctor, whoever needed to know, and uh, get it taken care of. Yeah, including the patient definitely optimizes your care. Yeah. You know, if you just go off what basic, what you're seeing, and you're not really getting to know what the person is feeling, it really limits your scope of what you're able to to see is going on with this person. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you just need to be what the patient needs you to be on that day. Like one day I went to one of my favorite patients' houses. She had broken her elbow, and I thought I was just going to go in, do some stretches, do some uh, range of motion stuff. It was basically all... Um, ortho related and I go in or I knock on the door and she can't even get to the door because she's so sick laying on the couch and I ended up going in and uh taking care of her while she you know holding her hair while she was vomiting and getting her a wet washcloth and taking out her trash but you know that's what she needed that day so that's what mm -hmm. I did was, was I able to really document that as a therapy session no, but you know, how am I it supposed to? It was what was needed. Yeah, it was, it was needed. I'm not going to go in there and make somebody do an exercise when they're laying on mm -hmm. the couch, can't even move. That is a big deal, though, for you to notice that because some people will just go in and say, hey, we're going to have to do this exercise, whether you like it or not. And the reactions those people have to not being hurt, when, when people aren't hurt, you know, you, yeah. you're going to lash out and, and it just ruins the care for everything. So run me through a normal day. When you say occupational therapist, you're going specifically to their house, right? So um, not not necessarily. That's just the rotation that I had. Because there's some in the hospital. Yeah, right? yeah. So hospital, outpatient clinics, home health, you know, wherever you can apply occupational therapy, that's where it can be. So but when you do I, rotations, what rotations have you done? So I've only done home health. I did that in Jacksonville, Florida, and then I'm about to do a pediatric one in an outpatient setting. So the parent will bring the kid and then go home. Whereas in home health, I called my patients the day before and then went to their house. Okay. And so they didn't have to go anywhere because uh, that was all for like geriatrics. So they all either weren't able to get to, to an outpatient clinic or for one reason or another. So I we go to their homes. And do you go with a like yes uh yes i went with my a clinical instructor um we 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 saw some stuff that i would not be comfortable dealing with alone I, especially early yeah yeah, yeah. especially see. as a student there was a couple times where i had to say hey hey i'm just a student and mm. i'll be <laughs> i do that every yeah time. yeah yeah it, it really helps sometimes just to be able to take a step back and say i don't know i'm a student so yeah. i'm good i'm definitely gonna miss that when i when i'm board certified and have to have to do things on my own i might still do that yeah hey this is, it's my first day it's my first hey, day uh, i'm just a <laughs> resident and he's like it says attending on your badge <laughs> yeah so do you go by like when you're going to specific people's houses do you have a certain time that you're supposed to work with them like from 10 to 12 and then you're supposed to go to another person um so with home health it was kind of cool because we made our own schedule and with therapy, you're with the person anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour just based on what you do that day. But we would call our patients the day before, and usually nobody wants you in their house before 9 a.m. That makes sense. So <laughs> I wouldn't either. But so our day would go from 9 a.m. till whenever, just dependent on the caseload. And we always tried to group whoever was near each other, like location wise, we always try to go see those patients in one day and then go over here to another part of town and do those patients another day to try to save save gas and time okay so for your doctorate you have to do a specific project in the field that you want to go into what field do you want to go into so right now and that you're feeling now you don't have yeah to right now someone. you know it may it may be different tomorrow but i'm really really interested in travel therapy and ergonomics so 
my capstone project is uh, with er ergonomics within industry uh, to prevent musculoskeletal disorders. And when I say that to anyone outside of the medical world, they're like, what the heck is she talking She's about? She's making keyboards. And, <laughs> and most of the time, you know, I don't even know what I'm talking about. But I, my plan is to go in and to a company and evaluate how their workers do their job so that I can look at it and see if there's a more efficient way that they can do their work to prevent like arthritis, rotator cuff tears, any, mm. you know, any, any injury that would keep them from working. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah. I find myself and there, and there's even some specialties in the ER where like I can't help myself but try to figure out the best way things are handled, like the best way a room should be arranged for me to get my stuff. Where everything set up, it means a lot. Yeah. And to ignore that part is huge. But I, I can't. That that's always in the back of my mind. Like I did this, and now what? How can I do that better? Right. Right. And yeah. And I think I think this project will be really cool in this field because occupational therapists are like currently the only healthcare profession that does task analysis. So they they watch a person do a task and break it down into every single motion or every single thing that that person had to do to ac accomplish that task. And I feel like that's important with like industry work because these people are doing the same thing mm. all day and it can easily lead to some kind of injury. How long are the notes you have to write then? Are you writing, do you have to write a specific patient note when you go to uh, the house? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So so we have to document every session with every patient, basically, like the second we step in the door to the second we leave. Just exactly. In case, I've read. Yeah. You, just in case something happens. And um, I can speak on the importance of how absolutely necessary it is to put in every single detail because I actually may be subpoenaed back to court because of uh, one patient that I had one day. Uh, we showed up to his house and we we couldn't get him on the phone to schedule a therapy session so we did this thing called we like to call a drive by which is not not the not what you would typically think a drive by is but it's where we show up You didn't plan on murdering No no okay. no I didn't not, plan on it but uh, you didn't plan on it. <laughs> I didn't plan on it but <laughs> after this happened to me I I, I thought about it so we did a drive by and it's kind of just where you show up unannounced because, you know, the doctors order therapy for a reason. So we were like, we'll go check it out and see if this guy really needs us or not. And so we show up and we pull up. There's nobody really. It's kind of like a we're like, is this house abandoned? Is there really somebody in there? What's going on? So these two people walk out and they asked us who we were we told them and they're like oh well we're just the friends we're here to clean up because he's basically a hoarder and i'm like oh come on like like i said you really never know what you're stepping into so i got masked up gloves you know everything goggles to protect myself because i've watched the show hoarders yeah you know you never know so, so i go in we go in and the patient's in the bathroom he's only hoarding fine china <laughs> in like a no nice unfortunately place. unfortunately he's hoarding bugs and poop and urine uh, all over that the floor usually it tends to be the yeah things yeah. That people are collecting yeah and cockroaches and whatnot but he's in the bathroom and you know, I just give my clinical instructor this look like, can you handle this? Because I'm a tad bit uncomfortable. So she <laughs> she took the reins and she said, hey, you know, we're your occupational therapist. We're here to help. And he's like, well, I'm in the bathroom. I don't know. I don't want to do that today. And the other people in the house told us that he had had a heart procedure and he wasn't taking his medicine. So he was falling all over the place and whatnot. Well, while I'm standing out in the one spot on the floor that's not covered in pee the patient's brother walks in and is like we're taking him to the hospital and then the patient's wife who does not live with him comes in and the brother's like oh so now you want to show up and so they get into like some kind of argument and i'm standing there like am i supposed to mediate this am i supposed to no yeah i, I didn't know what to do so i was just standing there with my clipboard and um, just document just, everything. Yeah, just just documenting everything. And the wife ends up assaulting the brother 
while my clinical instructor is trying to get the patient out of the house and to the car so we can get him to the hospital because he was not he was not well. What? So are you what car are you all in? So what, yeah. we we drive my clinical instructor, or she drives me around all yeah, day. Yeah, so you don't have like a, an ambulance or anything. No, no, You're no, just no. To get they okay. so they didn't want to call an ambulance because they wanted him to go to the VA hospital, Jeez. which was in Gainesville. And the wife was like, "No, I'm taking him." And the husband was like, "No, I'm taking him. You're not. I don't trust you to get him there." So anyway, the brother got assaulted by the wife. The patient. We get him to the car, and then my uh, CI is like, Melissa, just go call 911. Like, we can't do this by ourselves. Yeah. So I call the cops, and I'm like, hey, I just witnessed domestic violence. Can you please send somebody out here? And so the cop came, and then the cop ended up calling the ambulance. But it it was just messed up because <laughs> the guy was, like, falling all over the place while we were there, and he was acting like he couldn't walk and this and that. And as soon as the cop pulls up, he gets out of the car and he runs back into the house, like with no cane or nothing. The patient? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, bro, what? <laughs> so. <laughs> he's just like, oh, God, the cops. The cops are yeah, yeah, he's running. Like, he's like, oh, shoot. So he, he's, he's like, the fastest yeah, one in the house. Yeah. And I'm like, really, bro? So then I'm telling the story to the cop and I just felt so disrespectful because he asked me exactly what happened. And in times of like crisis and emergency, I have like the best memory to recall exactly what happened. So I'm just dropping these constant F bombs to the, to the, to the cop. Cause he saying that you're saying you're, no, I'm, 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 I'm I'm repeating or I'm, you know, talking about exactly what happened. So I, I I won't say what was said on, on here, but it was, it was pretty vulgar. Yeah. My mom might listen or (laughs) you can say whatever, but it's best just whatever. It was a lot of F bombs. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the, uh, Patient ended up leaving in an ambulance, and the wife left in the cop car in handcuffs. Oh, my God. So they were like, ma'am, can we get your information just in case we need you to, I guess, whatever you do in court they, when you witness you something that like memory. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, we documented the heck out of that, out of that session because I just don't, you just never know. You just never know. Yeah. That's wild. <sighs> It's dangerous when you go to some of these people's houses yeah, and they like, don't take care of themselves. Right. And, and that's what I was saying. Like, you, you really do not know what you're stepping into. And as much as I would love to do home health because you get to see a person in their natural environment and, like, how they actually function in their home. And I feel like that's where the best progress can be made is where they spend most of their time. I would love to do home health. But it's just kind of dangerous by yourself. mm and I, you know, I'm 120 pounds, five two. Like, there's only so much protecting myself I can do. But I was very glad to have my clinical instructor there with me at that at that time. I remember I did, and I like shadowed some EMS uh, people when I was trying to get into medical school. I think it was like still in college, and I remember I rode around in the ambulance just to. Uh, I mean, I was so fascinated with all the aspects of medicine and everything I could take in. I was like, I would just go do whatever I could. And the EMS guys were like, you can come ride with us. And I was like, bet. So I spent a, and I think this was actually my first day. But so we go to this place and the best way to describe it is how like my family would call it, which is a roach motel. (laughs) It was like we had driven into the boondocks. And this was essentially like a freestanding trailer. And it was a, 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 some uh, report on this guy having uh, respiratory distress. And he was, I guess, already known to some of the people because they were like, you know, we, we got to get there, get this guy and bring him back. And when we got to the place, I'm telling you, there was there was dogs running around. There was so many people. There was like nine or ten people just sitting around in the living room all smoking like cigarettes yeah and drinking and stuff this guy was in like so we had to walk through this nasty room and nobody's like gotten up or anything like they somebody opened the door and then walked and they all and they were just still smoking with us 
in the house. So like it's just smoke is billowing out of the house and the guy is in his room and he's sitting there with an oxygen tank and he's holding it over his mouth and he has a lit cigarette in his hand and he was switching from the oxygen to the cigarette and then he would he would like blow out and then he would do the oxygen again and they would take another hit and I remember well first off that's extremely dangerous to anybody that does yeah like the oxygen in the oxygen tank is highly flammable. And so he's smoking. That's not something you're supposed to be doing. You would just not believe he could make the this stuff whole that place people do. Yeah, like yeah, and and he's doing it with all like everybody is doing all. It just was nasty. We had to go like kind of get him. He wouldn't even put the sick. We had to like the. Luckily, I was with the EM. I was just there for watching and like occasionally if somebody like the most I did was like hold a lady's hand in the back of the ambulance. But this guy, <laughs> this guy was. I mean, I remember I was thinking the whole time, like, this could be not only dangerous for everybody else, but also, like, because I usually Uh, don't think about myself, but... I was like, if this thing sometimes you have to, we're all, but it it, that makes me think, like, who even called nine one one? Because who? It's like it's like you should have heard him. He could he he could not breathe, and he's still smoking. Well, exactly. And for people to be, you know, for somebody to call and then them all just sitting out smoking, it's like who even called? Why who even called? Because who even cares about this guy if y'all are all just sitting there? still smoking Mm -hmm. i I don't know some stuff people do makes no sense and i have come to find out that my job is mainly teaching people the stuff that you would think would be common sense yeah it's crazy and i mean that's the one thing of where you realize that just going to somebody else's house if they don't take care of their own situation it can actually be not only dangerous for them because it was definitely not a good living room or living situation for the guy because he was so sick. He had right. all this, I'm sure he contributed to it with his smoking because he was still doing it. But <laughs> it was also, it was, it was wild. Cause I was thinking the whole time, like I was like, this guy does not need to be here. Right. And, uh, something hard for me to learn while doing home health was just because that's the way that person chooses to live doesn't make it wrong just like just because that's the way that's not the way we were brought up or that's not what we Mm. come from if that if that's how they choose to live then that's how they choose to live that's a good point yeah i i have no judgment like he can do that all the time the only thought is like if somebody's coming to save your life and then you blow everything up yeah because you're just not paying attention or you just don't know uh i mean it said hot that was the crazy thing is i don't even know at this i'm still young i don't even know that the oxygen tanks are flammable except like in a movie right right and i'm looking at it and except it's, for it's that like big old red x yeah and it's flammable and it's on one side of the yeah. bed and his ashtray is on the other and i was like well, we're going I, down i just don't Today's get it the- but you know if you want to live with cockroaches everywhere more yeah, power I mean, to you. It, it really is more power to you. I, I just, I, it, there is a situation where you're like, oh, because you're going to be going to people's houses and, you know, right, it's kind of, right. Do you want to work with children or do you want to work with adults? I really liked the uh, geriatric population, except, you know, there's always a few that didn't turn out so well. But I liked geriatrics because as much as I helped them, they helped me too. Mm. As far as like, those people have lived a long time and they can teach you a lot about life just in those 45 minutes that you you spend with them if you really if you really take time to get to know them um i mean there's so many so many times that i would go home and like cook something that my one of my patients told me about because it was a tried and true recipe in their family but i i like the geriatric population a lot that's awesome that's a good that's a good way to explain that. I'm glad you're learning new recipes. Yeah. <laughs> Not saying grandma. I'll ever cook any for you, but you know. Yeah, I haven't seen any. Uh, I'm, I'm on break. Cooking. I'm on break. I hadn't done a thing. So, when what are your duties as a student when you go to these places? Do you is it just um, to do whatever they need? So, you mean like how does the clinical experience work or yeah, like, like what, what I, I understand that that person knows the job and they're pretty much doing it and then you can help. But I just didn't know, do you have any specific duties as a student or is it kind of just however the clinical coordinator is feeling and what they want to help you with? I know it's it's kind of, it's kind of case by case. Basis. Yeah. 
everybody had a different experience with their clinical instructors. I mean, mine was great. She let me shadow her and, you know, she did all the work for a while. And then I got to slowly start doing stuff on my own till the end. I was doing all the sessions by myself. She was just there to watch. Whereas some of my friends had the entire caseload by themselves since the second day. It, mm. it's, it's just how the clinical instructor chooses to make it. Okay. So what would be your favorite task that you had to do when you were taking care of people? Honestly, you, yeah. this is going to sound so weird, but I loved helping people take a shower. I, it's interesting because you just said I, it even was though I just <laughs> getting them there, yeah, but the actual showering is nice. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was fun because you don't realize... You don't often shower, so you're like... Yeah, I, I mean, I might as well do that. <laughs> might as well hop yeah. in. Um, you don't realize how, you know, what you have until you don't have it anymore. And how good a shower made these people feel was just so rewarding. And it, it's proven that a shower is the most effortful self-care task. And so for me to go in and be able to offer help to someone who hasn't bathed and God knows when it was, it was fun. And uh, besides, <laughs> besides the time, my, my favorite patient of the whole thing, he had very bad uh, Alzheimer. Like he was in, in the late stages of Alzheimer's and I would, I would try to get him in the shower. I couldn't say, Hey, let's go take a shower. Cause he would say, I've already done it. I don't need it. Hmm. And his or as your family would call it, old timers. Yeah, yeah old timer. They've, they've yeah, great, they're really good with the medical. <laughs> okay, carry on with your story. Um, so he would say, "I've already taken a shower today. I don't need one." Whereas his wife would say, "No, he hasn't taken it since last week when you were here." Mm. So I would have to say, "Follow me," instead of saying, "Let's go take a shower," because you just have to break it down one task at a time. And so I would get him in the bathroom, all clothes, shoes and everything, have him sit in the shower chair. And I say, okay, let's take off our shoes. Well, why do I have to do that? I I'm just trying to help. Can you take off your shoes? And so he would take off his shoes. And then there was a one day when I was trying to get him in the shower and he was like, did I do something bad? Are you trying to kill me? And I'm like, no, no, God, no, please don't think that. I'm just trying to help. Like he thought I was absolutely trying to kill him. But it ended up working out fine. And he always was so happy to be clean. And, you know, he would thank me for my help when I was done. And I was like, see, I, I, I promise I wasn't trying to kill you. But showers were my favorite thing. Nice, nice, nice. So what would be your least favorite then? Oh, gosh. You know, there's not really anything I I didn't like doing unless it was something that I knew we had to do that the patient didn't want to do. Because mm. when someone's not cooperative, it just makes the session drag on and on. and Significant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but I like all parts of it. Every day is different. It's, like I said, it's just dependent on what the patient needs. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess something we could we can bring it back up because I never even harped on this. Uh, we just went right into the heavies. But how was living in St. Augustine? Oh my gosh, St. Augustine was a blast. I essentially I lived with a random person that I met on Facebook. Uh, I joined the St. Augustine. She you, went to school. Yeah, 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 yeah. I went. Just, sorry, sorry, sorry. I went to. I ended Joe up. Joe that lives on the beach. Yeah, I went to school with her. Uh, we met through Facebook, and I was like, I can't afford rent. Can you? And she's like, No. So we ended up moving in together, and I, I really didn't know how it was going to be living with somebody from Minnesota. But I taught her a lot of things, especially Southern lingo. But she taught me a lot of things too. We had a good time, and we had the best friend group. I can't say enough about my friends I made mm -hmm. when I was down there. And you can probably agree, like when you're going through absolute hell, like there's no other way to put this level of school, like it's legitimate hell. When you're going through that with a group of people, you really do get close. Like mm -hmm. you bond over the highs and lows of that experience. And those people, I'm still close with them and probably will be still close with them forever. Living living at the beach 
for school was great. It was nice to be able to like walk out on the beach, take a walk or, you know, do whatever after a hard day of sitting in my apartment <laughs> <laughs> on Ring Central in class. But I had a I had a great time in St. Augustine. Probably drank too much, but you know, you do what you got to do. You got to do. You got to your liver recovers. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, that was something that I can also attest to is, for one, schooling, this late in life, when you have friends and people, really, you don't want to be, in my case, I'm 29. Yeah. You don't want to have not, you don't want to not have steady income and you're still kind of on that fluctuating. I'm still, it feels like you're almost 18 trying to get into college. Right, right. You're still, you're just hustling, trying to get all these grades and teachers are all different and everything. And you're, it really is. It's, it's very difficult just at a baseline to be schooling at this time. Right. I agree. I agree to be, to be 25 and still be in school when, you know, most people we know are like moving on with their lives mm. like they have their jobs and they have a spouse and they have kids and here we are like still living on student loans it's it's not easy and it's not to have a group of people that you can count on to know what you're going through really really helps exactly and it and and the schooling ramps up too you're it, yeah. it definitely is more intense when it's when you're paying for it and everything and oh absolutely yeah. when when you know this is money i'm gonna have to pay back you take a little bit more seriously mm. then um but yeah i made a, a lot of good friends in grenada that will carry on just because I don't know, it's kind of like in the struggle, and like you're saying, when you're going through hell, you really appreciate all the people around you. So yeah, that's really good. Is there ever a moment that made you feel like important while you're being a student, like something that you were glad you were there for, or something like that? Honestly, there was a lot of times where I got to be an example in class because I am not a quote unquote normal person. So they got to that's use me, to <laughs> yeah. It. So they got to use me as an example for as someone who has like limited range of motion or you know left-sided weakness because of my brain injury i i got to show my classmates what it was like not to be normal because like i said all we had was each other to practice on and we never got to see actual patients so to be able to to show that to my classmates was pretty cool that's crazy. That probably was so beneficial because what I was describing earlier about knowing somebody that has a condition or having seen it before means a lot because when you're learning this stuff, especially for me in medical school, it was you learned what was right and what was wrong. Right. And then you would get tested. We would have these like clinical scenarios where we'd go in and see patients and they would say that they had stomach pain and they, and you would touch them and they would somewhat flinch, but it, it, you could tell. It yeah. Was all, it was it, all it's fake. So they fake. Didn't have, it's so fake. Our and if you're looking for muscle strength, you can't, yeah, you can't, you same. can't pretend you can't make that up. You know, you either have it or you don't. And so that's you can just where tell they're being weak. Right. Right. And, and it's like, like, come on. I know you're a paid actor. I know what yeah. the, I know that my it tuition, right out of yeah, it. I know my tuition is paying you right now. But it, so it was cool to be able to give my classmates a, um, you know, real experience with some of that stuff. Yeah, there's a couple times they were like, wow, you really need to you never like apologize for them being sick. And they really harped on how we should be empathetic. And they were like, once somebody says I have some pain, you should be like, oh, I'm sorry for your son. And I'm hearing them and i just am acting like how i normally do yeah. which is like and it's not that i rush at all i'm definitely the one to be very personable right but i just me apologizing for their stomach pain the first second i see you is not that's a my little first. weird it's it's just like i don't know and you. i know that they don't yeah. have stomach pain so I, they're <laughs> I not even looking at pain. they're just like ah <laughs> yeah and then they go back to look at normal and then i'm like was that stomach pain? And they were like, you didn't apologize. I was like, why would I apologize? Practicals, practicals are a different world. Like it's a whole different ball game because like our, for our practicals fourth term, we had them in person. Um, but every, every time before that it was online where I used my roommate as my partner and you know, online fake it till you make it. They can't, they, there's only so many angles that the computer covers. You're just and using an iPhone 7. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, fake it till you make it until we got to in person where either a professor or another student was your, was your fake patient. And with practicals for people that are not in this type of school, it's where you, it's like a, 
supposed to be like a real scenario with a real patient and you basically get graded on every move you make once you walk through the door and there's for us um I don't know about you Jordan but for us there was like certain things that if you did or didn't do it was an auto fail Mm, um yes it was very similar like I mean they were harping on everything like it was a check on like even if you didn't move your stethoscope in the exact way that they wanted you to do like front to back and do it in this direction or if you didn't say specific things they would yeah it, it's it's kind of ridiculous and it's almost naughty it's not even realistic because there was one time i'm just gonna be honest i i failed three out of five it was either three out of five or three out of six practicals the um my last term and i'm pretty sure that's a record for the school <laughs> um but you know you, what your top student i, I passed too. i passed all the retakes but i failed for stupid stuff it was like there was one time my patient had ms and was in in acute care and i'm like and i'm like first of all why would you go to acute care for a flare-up of ms but anyways, she was like, I can't move and blah, blah, you know, just really, it was my teacher and she was just really playing, trying to play the part. And I'm like, I, I looked at her during the practical and I was like, look, if you want to get out of this hospital, we need to get out of the wheelchair. And I failed because apparently that was not professional. <laughs> and <laughs> In the hospital, people would probably be like, thank God, we need to get Melissa in, in there and talk to this patient. I'm, <laughs> I'm a very, I'm a very like blunt therapist because i i want these people to get better and when you know so much about the condition and you see it presented to you in real life you can tell like if the person is performing up to their standards up to their yeah. standards and if they want to get better and so so i'm just like i honestly it makes me mad sometimes i'm like look i'm here to do this if you don't want me here i'm gonna leave well, you have a unique perspective, too, because you are, in a way, like, you can empathize way better. Like, if I'm looking at somebody that's struggling to stand up, and I just go, like, come on, man, can, <laughs> you, you got to stand. Yeah. That's real rude. It's not very empathetic on my regard. So I can understand, like, teaching people that are completely, like, if you're saying if they were teaching a group of me's, it's like, hey, you need to be a lot more empathetic because this person's not going to see you in the same light when you're telling them to stand up they're going to be like well thanks man you're do you're you're speaking doing a lot yeah, from the yeah, sideline yeah. but your yours is a unique perspective because in a way you have kind of gone through a similar situation and so your frustration is not with the actual person unless they're like you know that they can go further yeah. and so you're kind of pushing but when it's a fake scenario it just there's little cues in the whole thing that just throw you off it, and it's just i'm just not a person that can be fake so when you throw a fake scenario at me i it's hard to take seriously when and then your grade depends on it and so i just had a rough time with practicals but you know it's over with i got through that part right. so all you gotta it do doesn't is make matter it I remember at SGU, it was so subjective. So they had, it wasn't even the actual teachers that would be watching us. It would be these facilitators or these essentially students that had already graduated, but maybe they weren't into medical school or something like that. They would come back and they would, you know, help out in like group activities or things like this. And these facilitators also, on a side note, are like hanging out with the students, doing other things. So there's easily a way that there could be a grudge or they see you around. They're just kind of like, Ugh, yeah. I am. So they had all the say during this, like SGU would video, but it was a huge deal where it was, it was just them. And there was multiple times where I remember it was very, very subjective. I went and they wouldn't tell you your grades at first, but I had to go and like ask because I was, I don't know. I'm kind of a nerd. I, I want to know what I did. Right, wrong. Right. And they were all over things that were either dumb or like, uh, it was it was so like he wrote something in one time and the even the guy that handed me the paper was like I don't know why I wrote well but we can't change anything I was like exactly why am I yeah and that's it's the just thing. like how they felt it, about the situation it's it, like oh I don't feel like he was very empathetic in the in the moment and it's like okay that, sir I'm sorry I'm getting graded on the way that I breathe right now so yeah. it, it, that's what they're doing they're really yeah. grading you on almost like their personality and how they like that's the feel. thing they're so subjective and and we had like teachers that weren't even teaching the class 
grading our practicals. So all that they were given before the, they started grading was the rubric. But it's just, it's, it was a different standard for every grader because of the subjectiveness of the format of the way that it Yeah. Did. And I mean, it was really crazy because I would have, you would have some people that were like, oh yeah, I got this guy. And then they would do great. And then you had just worked with the same person. That, or you'd and you would go in and do the knew. yeah, and you would go in and do the same thing, but because whoever was grading it didn't like the way you did it, then you got docked. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't feel it, like practicals are a true test of knowledge or clinical it clinical ability. It shouldn't be the cutoff, right? Like, I guess I understand a way of testing to make sure people know things, and then you're like, okay, let's do it again, let's do it again. But for that to be like, well. This is most of your grade, you know, I'm oh, sorry, it's going to affect a lot. That That's not a really good way to think about it in my mind, because if you're going to make it subjective, then it shouldn't be considered a test. It, like a test I agree. Ha- should be, everybody should kind of have a, a test should be it. like black and white. Like yes. you either do or you don't, it is or it isn't. Whereas these practicals, there's just no way to yeah. make it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it it really is wild trying to figure out what everybody um, would want from you and everything like that. What is one of the things that you're looking forward to whenever you actually get that degree? Get that degree? Oh, gosh. Besides your title. Yeah, <laughs> that that is exciting, the title part. But I'm just looking forward to getting paid to do what I'm passionate about and what I like. I mean, I went to undergrad and got my degree in psychology because they said melissa after they after two years they were like melissa you need to pick a major you did good in psych so just go with that and Mm so undergrad for me was just kind of blah but to be in ot school and know that i'm gonna get paid to do something that i enjoy is um exciting that's awesome yeah that's a great answer is there anything that would make your job easier as an like whenever you become an occupational therapist is there anything that you've noticed even at the student level that really could make that job easier honestly the public understanding of what occupational therapy is the fact that occupational therapy is not widely known and you know because i would go into somebody's house and they'd say what are you here for and i would say well i'm here to work on things like bathing getting dressed going to the bathroom brush your teeth well why do i need that when the physical therapist was just here it's misconstrued and we are more under the radar than we should be so just making the benefit of what we do public knowledge Mm. would be a lot of help i can see that where especially when i first started working at the hospital i was confused at the difference between occupational and physical therapy yeah um, and even that, still, I can get, I understand the difference, but the actual task that is being done, I don't know, should it go to a physical therapist or an occupational? Right, one? right. Which that will never be my decision to make. That's on you. And I, of course, <laughs> hope you choose OT. No shade at PT, but. Unless it's butt wiping or something, then you're going to get Hey, like, somebody, somebody said, you're just a glorified ass wiper. Okay, maybe I am. I get paid for it. But I get paid for it, and you ain't wiping your own. So, <laughs> <laughs> to me, the easiest ex patient explanation of physical therapy versus occupational is okay, so PT is going to get you to walk to the bathroom. Okay, so you're there. Where are you going to do now? That's where the OT comes in. We got to brush our teeth. We got to go to the bathroom. We got to shower and groom ourselves and whatnot. So that's how I kind of explain it to a patient. I don't know if I'm doing the, you know, that's the best way to do it. But I've, I've, I've found that people place more value on it when you put it that way. No, that's a great way of explaining it because that way you're, you, you almost have to simplify the roles of the thing before you start getting complex. Some people aren't going to understand it. Some people aren't in the medical field. Field and then they don't care right. one is your sister <laughs> zero she's calling it cerebral or, no, like, cerebral, <laughs> cerebral, cerebral and then arguing with me that i'm calling it wrong i'm like wait i think it's right and she's like no it's not do you i mean do you even know the parts of the brain come on now i was like wait that's there's no part yeah. of the brain she i was like do you know what the cerebellum does she's like no what is that <laughs> like, yeah so you're doing all the daily living aspects of a patient's life yes which is very crucial especially that's one of the ways you know people are dropping off like whether they have 
like dementia or something like mm-hmm. that. When people aren't taking care of themselves, it starts to drop. Right, quickly. right. And I, I really like that part of it. I like to be able to not only deal with the physical deficit, like if someone breaks their hip and I have to teach them to use like a sock aid or something like that. I like to incorporate cognition too because the brain is everything and if you don't have that you pretty much have nothing and to see someone be so happy about doing something so simple is so rewarding so i'm really glad that i went down this path is there any goals that you want to accomplish i would guess besides your doctorate you definitely want to accomplish that one but is there any other goals that you hope to accomplish either during this time or even after i honestly i haven't thought about that i guess i i I should but with my there's no pressure you don't have to make up anything yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna sit here and make up goals that i don't have no yeah your goal (laughs) is getting out of i'm just right exactly like i said i'm just trying to make it out so no yeah yeah yeah. you don't have to i was just i was just yeah just (laughs) if you had a good answer throw it at me (laughs) but i don't so i got one though after learning medicine and doing this, all, your schooling and everything, has it given you a different outlook on maybe things that are happening in your own family or people that you see around the street? Yeah, like so I, I can't go anywhere without looking at the way people are doing stuff and the way people's houses are set up and how I would do it differently to make it safer and this and that. And both of my grandmothers are starting to struggle with their own issues, whether it be, you know, cognition and dementia or something physically related. And it's hard when it's family because I know what I need to do because I've done it and I've seen it on other people and I've seen it work. But it's hard when it's family because I still don't want to accept that there's a problem with Mm. someone that I care so much about. To know so much about what is going on with my grandmothers and not being able to, you know, take it back or or make them better. It's hard. Yeah. And and then to take what I know and dumb it down for my non-medical family, that's also hard. And you can only you can only do so much. So, yeah, that's interesting, too. We'll have to actually I'll just ask that one right now. Is it different? learning medicine and you you come from a non-medicine family right i come from the exact opposite so i can't say anything if i'm over here talking about a statistic and i misquote the right amount of o2 that you need or something i get immediately called out right and most of the women in my family are in healthcare and are like strong women so they have no problem chopping down me yeah They're like yeah. you should probably not mention anything until you know for certain like, <laughs> oh my god mom <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, whereas for me, it's the complete opposite. And I, I could basically say whatever I wanted at this point, and <laughs> they would believe it uh, if it uh-huh. was if it was medical related, because, you know, they're not going to take the time to fact check me. Yeah, but it is different. And I, I, I and they're like, Melissa, how did you get so smart? I'm like, I, I'm really not that smart. I, I just That's read a, read a book or two. So you've read a, you probably read a couple of those. One of my favorite patients, he had some kind of brain tumor, and he was 49 at the time, had some kind of brain tumor that affected his mobility really bad. And then he ended up having his one eye sewn shut because I don't even know what happened, but his eye was sewn shut, so he was blind in one eye, and he was also deaf. And then he had this other syndrome that only 600 people in the world had ever had. And he was on my caseload, and I'm like, what the heck do I do with this guy? Because I'm like, first of all, how do I even communicate with him? And it was hard. I mean, we had to communicate through his mom, and she would communicate with him, and he was very impulsive, so he did what he wanted anyways. But long story short, he ended up dying, I think it was the day after his 50th birthday, and me and my clinical instructor had to go back to their house a couple weeks later and get back stuff that we had let them use like feeding utensils and a slide board and to go back into someone's house after you saw them and after you saw them progress and them not be there anymore because there was nothing that you could do to help them anymore it it was really hard to see that and to not take that home yeah it that can be one of the worst parts once you know it's on the on your back yeah, and you get there and you get home and you get a second to think. And all you can think about is that situation. It really does. It really can weigh on you. Anybody listening that's not in 
medicine. That is a unique factor because you're dealing with people the whole time. And most of the people that are in this field are going to be people person. Like that's the reason they're. You have to be. That's the reason that you're a a professional ass wiper. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. You want to care for people. You're just a naturally caring person, most people. And. It, it really can weigh on a lot of people. And so, you know, if if there's a situation like that and it's weighing on you or whatever, you can always reach out at the Off White Coat Podcast at Gmail or hit us up on Instagram at Off White Coat Podcast. Yeah, I mean, it, it really does. It sticks with you a little bit. Yeah. Like some of those tough stories. I mean, all I can say about it is if you're in healthcare for the money, go do something else. Yeah, that's the truth. You have to be like, you're like, oh man, like I was just, it started with love and grow stuff. And then it progressed to realizing that that was, I just wanted to know about the human body. Always. Right. It's like, I'm like, even like if it was a movie and they're like skin disintegrated and I could see the skull, I was like, oh, like, yeah. that's cool. I feel like you have to be drawn. You shouldn't be doing it for the money by no means. It's a, you're going to be broke even at 29. Right, right, right. right. We're, we're going to be paying off these loans for the rest of our lives. So I know. It is. <laughs> uh, yeah. How is like the inner collaboration between the doctors and the rehab team actually? Because they teach us how it should be and what we should be doing. But how is it? How has it been in your experience so far? Yeah, that is a good question. I think the best operating teams, like the hospitals that I've been at that really I felt like provided a like good care to the patients and everything. The teams worked in sync. I the, the only thing that might be better improved is the actual communication between the teams. It can feel like the, especially in my uh, experience with it, and now I work under the residents that are seeing, but the re- residents were so busy that a lot of the time it could just be them ordering things and then not, like very little communication outside of if there's a problem, you know, like they kind of just assumed it was all being taken care of. I remember one, the physical therapy team, they had a brilliant physical therapist that if anything was going wrong or you had a patient or something, they were like, Hey, get, and I'm just going to use a fake name or whatever, but Joanne on it. Yeah. And, and it was like, Oh, like, you know, we can't really like Joanne lean on Joanne, you know? And that was, that was a great thing. That her being great allowed her to have communication with the whole team right? because they realized that she was the rock in the, but as far as like just daily communication, there's a little, but it felt like the residents were constantly running around doing other things that if we were having to address certain issues with the occupational therapy team or anything like that, it usually was only if there was something wrong going on right. or something like that. But it wasn't it wasn't like bad. It wasn't like anybody looked down or anything like that. It was really just like the the teams are working hard and doing things at different times. Right. Like they're just. Like, yeah. Like so, we didn't hear from the from from my end. We didn't ever hear from the doctor. Like we would call and get verbal orders mm-hmm. from to do therapy on the first. Like we would do our eval and then we would have to call the doctor and say, we want to see this patient two times a week for four weeks or whatever. And they would approve it. And then we would do our thing and that would be it. Like we never actually had contact with the doctor, but it, it was kind of hard. And I, I do want to make it a priority in the future to build relationships with the surgeons and the doctors in charge of my patients cases, because when I went into someone, you know, I would go into someone's home and they would have a fracture or something like that. We're only allowed to do what the doctors say we can do. Exactly. And a lot of times the people's precautions would not be in their charts. So I only could go off of what the person said. And how am I supposed to know if they heard the doctor correctly about what they can and can't be doing? Like, I don't I don't want to be the one that puts somebody back in the hospital. So I saw I saw that lack of communication between the teams kind of delay care because if we would go into someone's house and they just had a back surgery and I didn't have a written list of their precautions, I wasn't going to get them out of bed. But yeah. just because I didn't know I have a general list of precautions that I know in my head, 
But if that's not exactly what the person's surgeon wants, I don't I don't want to overstep and do something that could cause further injury. So mm-hmm. hopefully in the future, I hope the communication yeah, improves. Yeah, I think that that is a good point to make because the communication is the key. Because like you're saying, if you, if it's not specifically spelled out, it's not your job to be inferring. You're actually at risk if you're going like, oh, well... I know it's not my duty, but I'm going to do it anyway because it feels right. Right. Um, especially with all the other steps, like the other people that are in the process, like the doctors and all the other people that are having their say in the orders. And I think that is a really good thing. I Like I was bringing up that lady that was a really good and she was a physical therapist, but it was the matter of the I think the reason the communication was so great with her and the fact that everybody was leaning on her was because it wasn't because, and she was great. When she walked by the doctor's desks, she knew everyone. And right. she said said something to them. The attending, she knew way better than the residents. Like the residents, she knew the attending better than the residents knew the attending. So like she's right. she it up she like made a it friend. a point to make those relationships. And that's yes. the problem with home health is you're on your own. You you go to these people's homes by yourself. OT is usually scheduled separately from PT. You don't get that collaboration as you do in the hospital. You kind of, it's just kind of not fake it till you make it, but kind of, you know, if you have a question, it's not like you can just walk down the hall and ask. Yeah. You're just doing things until somebody else is yelling at you. Right. Right. So that's why I'm grateful that I had a rotation in home health because usually uh, I've looked at job openings and stuff. The home health jobs prefer like at least a year experience in home health so that you know what you're doing before they send you out there. Because it mm-hmm. can get wild and you don't have a team to rely on. To rely on, yeah. Yeah, the communication could certainly be better. It, it's really good to know your whole team members and be working with them. And I know you will go out of your way to make a connection with them. Oh, yeah. They well, I just, I, yeah, I'm forcing myself on yeah. people. And I think that's a good outlook to have, especially early on. Like you're even still a student and you realize that is because I think that might be the biggest delay in care would be like, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to do this. So then they write a new order and then you can go back the next day and try again. And by that time, it's just too much right. time has passed. Right. Yeah. I mean, the communication definitely needs to improve. Maybe yeah. that's something that we we could work on. We can both when work we, on in a way. It, yeah, I mean, it definitely it definitely improves the care because you're not the one. If if speaking for physicians, you're not the one going to the house and making sure everything is in order. I will say this, like especially since I'm in rotations and everything, I've seen that while they teach ethics, once you get to the actual job. It's only on-job training from the people that are at the job. Like You learn the ethical code, but then depending on how the people are acting at the hospital that you're working at is the usually the way people tend to model their own behavior. Right. Whoever trains you is how you're acting. Pretty much, yeah. And so if you go to a bad residency where everybody's complaining, I noticed that almost every resident would complain as opposed to some nobody would. And then some it would be like, oh, I can't believe this patient's here for so long. And it trickled down. It, trickled it, down it really lot. is a trickle down effect. And you're only as good as the people around you. So you you asked me about my goals earlier. And I think I will make that a goal is to improve the communication between people, not only in the OT world, but all the people we work with as well. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a great way to end this, Melissa. That is phenomenal. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Melissa. This has been fantastic. I'm sure you've shed some light for a lot of people, especially if you're in occupational therapy school or anything like that. Um, if you have any questions for Melissa, please email us at offwhitecopodcast at gmail.com or you can find us on Instagram at offwhitecopodcast. Yeah. And is there anything that you would like to plug or you got <laughs> No, nothing I would like to plug unless someone out there that needs an occupational therapist uh, next January if you know, I'll be on the job market. Hey, somebody uh, better hire this guy. <laughs> yeah, somebody hire me. But for real, if you have any questions about OT, uh, the, how the school process works, how it was, 
going online or any any question at all about CP, I'm an open book and I'm I'm here to help. So and thank you. I can easily find her in contact. Yeah, her. yeah, Jordan. Jordan's always around. So thank you for having me on. It was fun, and I hope to hopefully be back on another episode soon. Oh, yeah. And this this was great. I, th- I think this is going to help some people out. So thank you, everybody. We out. Hey, everyone. I want to take this time to tell you about our friends over at True Learn. They have this top-of-the-line test bank that is perfect for any upcoming board exams that you may have. They have test banks for all types of exams. So whether you're studying for medical school, nursing school, OT, pharmacy, and others like speech pathology, True Learn is the way to go. If you're like me and going through medical school, they have a question banks for all the big exams, like Step 1, Step 2, and Step 3, with quality assessments for each exam. Look, I know we didn't go into healthcare because we love taking tests. This is the hard part of the job. Make it easy on yourself with TrueLearn. Sign up now with the code OFFWHITECOAT to get $25 off your purchase. That's OFF white coat, no spaces, to get $25 off your purchase. This is a test bank that you do not want to pass up on. Make this easy on yourself. Take the deal, pass your boards, and get back to enjoying the reason you went into healthcare. And make sure to use OFFWHITECOAT when you pick it up.